When I Grow Up by Richard E. Lowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. When I Grow Up by Richard E. Lowe. The two professors couldn't agree on the fundamentals of child behavior, but that was before they met little Herbix. The university sprawled casually, unashamed of its disordered ranks, over a hundred thousand acres of grassy, rolling countryside. It was the year A.D. 3896, and the vast assemblages of schools and colleges and laboratories had been growing on this site for more than two thousand years. It had survived political and industrial revolutions, local insurrections, global interterrestrial and nuclear wars, and it had become the acknowledged center of learning for the entire known universe. No subject was too small to escape attention at the university. None was too large to be attacked by the fearless probing fingers of curiosity, or to in any way overawe students and teachers in this great institution of learning. No book was ever closed in the university, and no clue, however tiny, was discarded as useless in the ceaseless search for knowledge which was the university's prime and overriding goal. For no matter how fast and far the spaceships might fly, or what strange creatures might be brought back across the great curve of the universe, or how deeply the past was resurrected or the future probed, of one thing only was the university quite sure. Man did not know enough. All manner of schools had come into being at the university, and often they functioned in pairs, one devoted to proving a proposition and the other to disproving it. And among these pairs of schools, two in particular seemed to exist on a most tenuous basis. Their avowed mission was to settle the age-old argument concerning the relative influences of heredity and environment. One, headed by Professor Miltchek von Posenfeller, worked tirelessly to prove that there was no such determining factor as heredity and that environment alone was the governing influence in human behavior. The other, under the direction of Dr. Arthur D. Smithlawn, was dedicated to the task of proving that environment meant nothing, and that only heredity was important. Success, in short, could only come to those who were born with the genes of success in their bodies, and failure was as preordained for the rest as was ultimate death for all. Over a period of more than two hundred years, the School of Environment had been taking babies from among the thousands of homeless waifs gathered in throughout the universe, and raising them carefully in a closely supervised cultural atmosphere. The School of Heredity, on the other hand, was more select. Its pupils came only from families whose genealogy could be traced back for at least a thousand years. Freedom of choice and expression was the rule here, since the school was attempting to prove that a child's inherited tendencies will send it inevitably along a predetermined path, completely uninfluenced by outside help or hindrance. In two centuries neither school had been able to develop an overpowering case in support of its own theory. Hence they both thrived and cheerfully ignored the discrepancies which existed in the case records of individuals who had not turned out according to the book. Although they were zealous professional rivals, Professor von Posenfeller and Dr. Smithlawn were devoted personal friends. They called each other Posey and Smithy, and got together once a week to play chess and exchange views on the universe in general. Only one subject was taboo between them, their experimental work. On this particular Saturday night, however, Smithy noticed that his good friend Posey was terribly agitated and disturbed, and had for the third time carelessly put his queen in jeopardy. "'My dear friend,' exclaimed Posey, blindly moving his king into check, "'could you possibly be persuaded to ignore for the moment our ban on professional talk? There is something.' Smithy secretly was only too anxious to talk at great length, but he pretended to give the request serious consideration. "'If it's really important,' he said, "'yes, by all means, go right ahead.' "'Smithy,' Posey plunged on, "'I am nonplussed. I am really terribly disturbed.' I've never felt like this before." Smithy waited patiently while Posey poured himself a large brandy and soda, hastily gulped it down, and made a face as he regretted the action. "'How much do you know about our methods of working in the School of Environment?' the professor asked, taking a new tack. "'Nothing, of course,' replied Smithy. The statement was not precisely true, but Smithy was not yet ready to confess that he had spies in his friend's school. "'Well, then,' 
said Posey, knowing full well that Smithy had been getting reports on his college for many years and feeling secretly glad that he, in turn, had been spying. Well, then, he repeated, you should be aware that we know absolutely nothing about the children we enroll. Most of them are infants. We do not know who their parents were or where they were born, except for the obvious clues which their bodies furnish. We do not even know their national or racial origins. We bring them up with absolutely equal treatment, the finest of everything. At the age of five we divide them arbitrarily into classes and begin training them for occupations. Some we educate as scholars, some laborers, some professional men. In me, dear friend, you see one of the triumphs of our methods. I myself was a foundling, raised and educated in the school of environment. Whatever I may be, I owe to the school." He paused to give Smithy a chance to digest the statement. Of course, Posey continued, we take into consideration such factors as physical build and muscular development. We don't train undersized boys to be freight handlers, but in general the division is arbitrary, and you'd be amazed how they respond to it. To keep a check on things, we interview our students twice a year to see how much they have learned. We always ask them what they want to be when they grow up. That enables us to determine whether or not the training is really taking hold. Occasionally, it is true, we find a case where the schooling seems to run counter to natural aptitudes. Smithy could not resist interrupting. Natural aptitudes? I am surprised to hear you use such an expression. I thought you furnished your students with aptitudes through environmental conditioning." Stiffly Posey retorted, "'Sometime we will have a full, objective discussion of the matter. It is not pertinent at this moment. Of course, I believe in natural or instinctive aptitudes, but I do not believe that they are inherited from parents or even from remote ancestors." "'Cosmic rays, perhaps?' needled Smithy and became instantly sorry when his friend's face began to redden. Posey didn't believe in cosmic rays, obviously. Smithy apologized. Posey sighed deeply and made a fresh start. My friend, he said, in your work, as I understand it, you learn everything you can about a student's past and about his progenitors. By doing so, you hope to be able to predict his future abilities, his likes and dislikes. But what course do you pursue when you find a boy who just doesn't prove out according to the prognostications?" Smithy mumbled a few evasive words in reply, but refused to be drawn into giving a positive answer. Never mind, Posey said. What would you say if I asked a boy what he liked or what he wanted to do, and his answer concerned something that never existed or had never been dreamed of, something horrible? Smithy's eyebrows perked up. He made no attempt to conceal the fact that his interest had been aroused. "'What precisely do you mean?' he demanded. "'Just this,' Posey said, leaning forward to give emphasis to his words. "'We have a boy who is being trained as a space navigator. He is very bright. He is of medium build, as spacemen must be, and he learns easily and willingly. We are sure now that he will be ready for pre-space school two years before he reaches the minimum age. Yet whenever this boy is asked what he wants to do, he replies, I want to be a destructor. Smithy's lips parted, but for a moment he remained completely silent while his mind stumbled over the strange term. Destructor, he repeated at last. Wait, said Posey, and listen carefully. This boy is now ten years old. He first gave me that answer three days ago. He repeated it two days ago, then yesterday, and again today. I had never interviewed him before. I never interview a student personally until the tenth year, so I quite naturally had his files double-checked. Smithy, he's been giving the same answer ever since he was five years old. Two interviews a year for six years, and three extra ones this week. Imagine! Fifteen times this boy has said he wants to be a destructor, and no one even knows what a destructor is. Well, Smithy said with a shrug, convinced that Posey was getting all excited over nothing. I admit it seems strange and highly single-minded for so young a boy, but don't you imagine it's some word he just made up? I admitted that as a possibility until this morning. But look here. Posey reached behind his chair and took up a small leather bag. Slowly he unzipped it and delved inside. Then with a grim flourish he brought forth the body of a cat. As Smithy's eyes widened, Posey said dramatically, Smithy, that boy killed this cat with a glance. With a what? A glance. You heard me correctly. He just looked at the cat and the beast dropped dead. 
And he did it to other things, too. A sparrow, a baby fox. Why, he even did it to a rat that had been cornered by this very cat. I tell you, I had never been so shaken by anything in all my life. I said to myself, Posey, have you got yourself a mutant? No, I replied. He's completely normal in every respect, physically and otherwise. He's a bit brighter than average, perhaps ninety-eight-six in his studies, including elementary astrophysics. He speaks brilliantly, composes poetry, even invents little gadgets. He's a genius, maybe, but not a mutant. Then I asked myself, how do you account for the cat? Posey paused, inferentially transferring the question to his friend. I can't account for the cat, Smithy said, unless we assume its death was a coincidence. But I confess you've aroused my curiosity. Could I see and talk to this boy who wants to be a, he grimaced, a destructor? I'm glad you asked, Posey sighed with relief. Actually, he is outside now waiting to join us, but I must warn you that you will find him quite precocious. However, he's extremely amenable. Posey went quickly to the door, opened it, and called, Herbex, come in. The boy entered. He was, Smithy observed, a quite ordinary-looking boy. He was so obviously ten years old that you couldn't say he was either old or young, large or small, fat or thin, or anything else, for his age. He was just ten years old and a boy. Herbix, said Posey, I want you to meet a friend of mine, the famous Dr. Smithlawn. How do you do, sir? Herbex said politely. How do you do? returned Smithy. He had already decided not to be patronizing, but to take a bold, frank, camaraderie course with the lad. Herbex, he said, Professor von Posenfeller has been telling me the story of your life. Now you tell me, Herbex, not what you want to be when you grow up, but why. I, I don't know, sir, Herbex replied easily. I only know that I want to be a destructor. But, Herbex, what is a destructor? Herbex looked around the room. He saw Smithy's birdcage, walked over to it, and stared for a moment quietly at Dicky, the doctor's parakeet. Dicky looked back chirped angrily twice and toppled from his perch. He landed on his back, his tiny feet rigid and unmoving. He was quite dead, Smithy observed, with a sudden detached unbelieving horror. Why, Dicky was seven years old, and he had been as good a pet as any lonely old professor could have desired as a cheery avian companion. Look here, young man, he began sternly. Then, as the shock passed, he hastily changed his tone. Suppose this child did have some strange sort of power, mystic, perhaps, but definitely abnormal. He may belong in the school of the future, Smithy thought, or perhaps the school of the past, the Dark Ages department, but not here. Don't worry, sir, Herbix said. I can't do it to you. But do what? Smithy cried. What did you do? I destructed. Smithy took a deep breath. He felt as though a cruel hoax had been played on him. After all, Posey could have lied about the cat and the other creatures, and the boy was quite obviously bright enough to learn lines and to play a part. But how to explain Dicky? He tried to calculate the coincidental odds that might have caused Dicky to die a natural death at one precise instant in time under unusual and exact circumstances. They proved to be incalculable to his unmathematical brain. He rubbed his face with the palms of both hands, then he turned abruptly to Posey. I just don't know what to say about it, he explained. How could I know? How can anybody know? He faced the boy again. Look here, Herbix. This, this power of yours, when did you first notice you had it? Last year, sir. I always knew I would do it sometime. But one day I was looking at a bird perched on my windowsill, and it fell over dead, just as your parakeet did. I thought it was an accident or a coincidence, but then the next day it happened again, with a squirrel. Soon I got to where I could do it on purpose, but I don't know how. Well, how do you feel about it? Do you want to kill these harmless pets? Oh, no, sir, I don't want to kill them. I just want to be a destructor. Smithy had a sudden disquieting conviction that he was in the presence of some completely alien, dangerous being. A cold breeze seemed to shiver through the room, though he knew his quarters were airtight and perfectly ventilated. This is ridiculous, he told himself, turning to Posey with a helpless shrug, to feel like this over such a nice-looking young lad. My friend, he said, all this has occurred so suddenly I must have time to think. Such a thing could never have happened in my school. Perhaps you should 
but doubtless it has already occurred to you, turn him over to the physio-psychological rebuilding. Posey nodded. It has, of course, but then I said to myself, Posey, there are a bunch of dunderheaded old fossils over there. They can take a criminal and tear him apart and make a good citizen out of him, granted. But do they find out why he was a criminal? Have they reduced the number of new criminals? No. And they would not find out why this boy wants to be a destructor, nor even what a destructor is. You're right, I told myself. And besides, Herbix is a nice boy. Why, with this power of his, if he wanted to do harm, there wouldn't be an animal left alive around the whole university. And if he could do it to people, he's had many an opportunity to practice on me. But has he? No, not once. Besides, if you keep him in school, you can maintain a good close watch over him. Herbix has promised to keep me fully informed as to the progress of his strange power. If he feels it getting stronger, he will let me know immediately. Isn't that right, Herbix? Yes, sir said the boy quietly. "'You are quite sure,' Smithy asked, "'that you know absolutely nothing about this boy's past, his parents, his birthplace, anything at all? There must be some clue.' "'You know very well I don't,' Posey retorted angrily. "'I just thought that perhaps you might have subjected him to hypno-research,' Smithy said placatingly. "'I wouldn't dream of such a thing,' Posey began, and stopped with a gasp. "'How did you know about that?' he demanded. Smithy was flustered. I, well, that is... He could think of no convincing answer. Hypno-research was one of Posey's most secret projects. He had used it constantly in his efforts to determine reasons for nonconformity to set patterns of behavior in some of his more recalcitrant students. He had kept it a secret because it added up to an admission that perhaps heredity could play a part in the development of a student's character. Smithy, my dear old friend, he said with mock humility. This is no time for us to quarrel. Let us face the facts candidly. You have been spying on my school, and I in turn have been spying on yours. I know, for instance, that when your students don't behave the way their heredity charts predict, you often use hypnotherapy to change their thought lines and force them to conform. Is that any less fair than what I do?" Smithy sighed. I guess not, my friend. No, wait. I will go farther than that. It is not a matter of guessing. I am quite certain about it. We are a couple of aging frauds, struggling selfishly along, playing with the lives of these children solely to keep our jobs. Perhaps we should— Nevertheless, we have a problem, interrupted Posey. It's a problem that won't be solved by our becoming senile idiots. Get your mind back on Herbix and help me. I feel this is a most desperate situation. If it gets beyond just the two of us, we are likely to be thoroughly investigated. Then goodness knows what would happen. But why? The child can do no real harm. Suppose he does destruct an animal or two. There are plenty more. And sooner or later they would die of natural causes anyway. And it's unthinkable that he could ever do it to... to people." Smithy paused, obviously struck by a startling thought. He turned to Herbix. Boy, he said quite sternly, come here. Herbix obeyed, advancing to within a foot of the old doctor and facing him squarely. Look me in the eyes, Smithy commanded. Questioningly, Herbix began to stare at Smithy. Well, Smithy said after a time, turn it on. A set look came over Herbix's face. His lips were compressed and a thin dew of sweat had broken out on his forehead. Posey stood aghast, slowly comprehending what his old friend Smithy was doing. He was actually risking his life, or so he believed, to prove that the child could not destruct a human being. He wanted to stop the boy, but he could not move from where he stood. Suddenly Herbix broke and turned away. He began to sob. It's no use, he cried. I, I can't do it. I just can't do it. Smithy went to him and put an arm on his shoulders. Tell me, boy, he exclaimed, what do you mean? Do you mean that you can't bring yourself to do it, or that it is physically impossible? Herbix just stood there, his head bowed, crying wildly. I, I just can't do it, he repeated, sounding now completely heartbroken. Posey, coming alive again, said soothingly, Don't cry, son. It's not bad. It's good that you can't do it. Herbix whirled around, facing Posey, his face inflamed with a sudden rage. But I will, he screamed. I will do it. I will. When I grow up. End of When I Grow Up by Richard E. Lowe